The weather was very bad when these terrible events took place. Dark patches of clouds covered the entire sky. It was raining heavily, and lightning struck one after another, continuously filling the entire sky with its intermittent lines. The place also had a gloomy picture. It was some area with newly built templates of high-rise buildings. When the family of the protagonist, who was still a child, was returning home, a truck crashed into their car, pushing them into the trunk. It was all a setup, the mother, clutching the child to her, guessed that it was Kim's family, who did not want to let them go, even though the father had given up the fight for the title and inheritance to live in peace, so they were surprised and frightened by this behavior of their relatives. Dozens of people hired by the family started shooting at the car, thousands of bullets pierced the air and flew towards it in a few seconds. When he hit the brakes, his father realized that some of the bullets had hit them and disabled them, so they were now flying at high speed and could not stop her, and his wife screamed that the doors could not be opened either. The father decided to save someone from an inevitable evil fate without wasting time, and threw a boy named Sam out the car window onto the road. The wind picked up the father's tears and carried them further in its direction, and he shouted to his son to make sure he survived. The car flew off the road, where there was a steep cliff that hid the sea behind it. The parents stayed in the car and went down with it. Thirteen long years have passed. It was a beautiful summer day outside. Only the sky was beginning to fill with dark clouds. A large cruise ship was calmly balancing on the small waves of water near the land. One guy stood at the edge and looked out at the scenery. He had beautiful golden-colored eyes. His black hair and white shirt were blowing in the wind, which picked up leaves from the ground and carried them around the neighborhood. They sailed to the City of Dragons. The boy came here to pay back a debt of thirteen years to his old friends, from the past who had treated his parents so harshly. It's time to let them know he's back. Suddenly, someone shouted at him, calling him blind. Sam turned toward the sound, not realizing what was happening. I saw a guy there who was about my age. He was wearing a purple shirt and white pants with his hands in the pockets. A girl was holding his arm. She was wearing a red dress with a large cutout near one of her legs. She was complaining about her grandfather because he had stepped on her expensive and beautiful shoes that Mr. Crowley had given her. It turned out that it was not the grandfather but his little grandson who had stepped on the foot, and the grandfather apologized for the boy and assured her that he could pay for the damage. The girl screamed with disgust in her eyes for him to stay away from her. Crowley began to threaten the old man. He said unpleasant things, that even if he gave the boy to someone for money, he would not be able to cover the costs. Behind these two stood two more guards wearing business black suits and sunglasses. He ordered one of them to throw the old man into the sea to be eaten by carnivorous fish. The guard immediately accepted the order, but then Sam came to the rescue of the grandfather and the baby and said that no one would touch the two of them with a finger as long as he was here. Hearing such a bold statement in his direction, Crowley decided to take the high road, threatening his status in this city, asking if this brave man knew who ruled this city. And Sam, in turn, asked if he knew who this grandfather was. Crowley said with a smug smile that he wasn't interested in who the old man was, but Sam decided to continue. This old man was a veteran of his city and country, a firefighter. These scars from his struggle to save lives symbolized his kindness and honesty. This man deserved to be respected, and this rich man humiliates him like this. For such behavior, it was he who should have been the fish food, not the old man. Crowley was nervous about this unexpected development and Sam's threats and decided to threaten his status again. He was from the Khan family. But Sam was not frightened by this. He quickly approached the no longer so confident Crowley, who took a frightened step back. With a menacing look, he asked if the family was really as influential as the man had said. Without waiting for an answer to his question, Sam easily lifted the rich Gentile with one hand, grabbed him by the shirt and threw him a few meters away. He flew face down to the ground, slamming his entire body on the floor of the parsonage. Sam asked him how he liked that answer and said he would show him his true strength as he continued to lie on the floor. The weather was still the same, 
with the wind still whirling the leaves in the air and the clouds covering most of the sky, but some rays of sunlight were breaking through. With their tails between their legs, Crowley and his henchmen fled the ship, but still threatening Sam with loud words. They were badly beaten, even his glasses did not survive. The young man responded to his cries with only the most vicious look. A bunch of this bully's wards were dressed alike, even the glasses. He stood at the bottom of the port and shouted at Sam to come down and get his stuff, while the secretary tried to calm his master down. But Sam just stood on top and didn't react, until someone really interesting showed up, and they were given away by the slight smile that appeared on Sam's face. They were also all dressed similarly, but not in the same uniform as Crowley's henchmen. They looked like soldiers, with discreet clothing, a shoulder emblem depicting a sword in black fire with a red background, and real swords and sheaths that were strapped to the side. Crowley wasn't expecting them, which meant they weren't here for him. Crowley, not understanding what was going on, began to ask what was happening and who they were. The secretary asked him to be quiet, because only the soldiers of the King of the East wore this emblem. The soldiers walked to the stairs leading to the deck and lined up in a pyramid shape. One of the soldiers raised his sword to the sky and said the name of his unit, the Eastern Detachment. All the others behind him joined in the salute and greeted their commander with respect. As he descended the stairs, Sam asked to be addressed by his first name because he had no rank or title. The first of the soldiers who stood closest to the stairs bowed his head. He had blonde hair that covered his eyes a bit, especially in this case when his head was down. He said that they could never address the commander by name. Sam addressed him by calling him Mason. He did not expect to be greeted like that. Sam asked if Mason had crossed the border for this meeting, and he replied clearly that he could be punished if there was reason to. He also asked if everything had gone well and if no one had crossed the commander, to which Sam pointed with a smile at Crowley and said that no one could touch him in this town. Crowley looked dumbfounded as each of the troops pointed their swords at him, and his secretary assured him that it was a simple misunderstanding. Mason gave them an ominous look and suggested that they continue this misunderstanding until the truth was decided. Sam, passing by these bullies, said that no one else was to blame, only Crowley. The latter was knocked down by this answer and fell on his ass begging for mercy. The guy went forward, and his whole army followed him, leading those bad guys by the collar. Crowley tried to pull away, but his attempts were in vain. A beautiful young girl in her early twenties with long dark hair, wearing a dark blue short dress with white sleeves. She crossed her arms and spoke nervously to the elderly woman. Her hair was gray, she was wearing a white blouse and pants, with a purple cardigan over it that matched the color of her pants. Behind them were two foreign cars, limousines that cost a lot of money. They had been waiting for someone for half an hour, and it was getting dark outside so the girl was very nervous, but her grandmother didn't seem to care much. But the girl did not calm down, they were waiting for her date, and it was unacceptable to wait for him for so long, so she decided to leave. The grandmother was not as kind as she seemed at first. When the girl decided to run away she stopped her and threatened that she would not be able to walk anymore. A man came running up and said that the gentleman would be here any minute. And then Sam appeared, followed by his subordinates. The grandmother reacted very quickly, but the girl asked her to calm down and slow down a bit. But the road between the bride and groom was blocked by Edgar, nicknamed Blade of Fire. He had the appearance of a manly man with numerous scars on his face, two cross scars, one going over the eye and the other under it, and one cutting the upper lip on the side. He had broad shoulders and a beard, and his hair and beard were colored a dark reddish-red hue. He accused Mason of crossing the border illegally and said he should be punished. My grandmother was amazed that such prominent figures as East Tiger, Mason, and Blade of Fire, Edgar had come here. Sam went over to greet Edgar and asked him who he was going to punish. Sam just wanted to shake hands with his friend, but he got down on one knee and greeted him in full. Except they were on equal footing, so Sam called it inappropriate and asked him to stand up. But the man did not calm down and continued his conversation, 
emphasizing that all five great commanders were ready to obey him, to which Sam was a little embarrassed and decided to simply agree by tapping him on the shoulder. Finally, he turned his attention to his grandmother and future bride. Approaching his grandmother, he got down on one knee. She was very happy to see him. They hadn't seen each other for a long time, and Sam had changed a lot since then. He had grown up but lost weight. The boy reacted very warmly to the meeting with the old woman. The grandmother ran to the car, grabbing Sam's hand, despite her age and the crutch she had been relying on. He asked her to take her time, to which she responded by ignoring his words and inviting him to her home. Before Sam left, he decided to decide what to do with his troops. He sent Mason and the rest of the troops back, keeping only one, Edgar. His subordinates accepted the order and immediately began to fulfill it. As they rode into the city, the morning sun was shining, the sky was clear of clouds, and the weather was beautiful and clear. Ten years had passed, and his grandmother could not help but rejoice at this event and miss the boy very much. Sam was grateful to his grandmother for everything, because if it weren't for her, he might not have become such a good husband, and he might not have lived to this age at all. Only now did the grandmother decide to introduce her granddaughter, whose name was Mia. The girl reacted nicely and politely and greeted the boy. They didn't love each other, and what's more, they had never even met before. So Sam accepted the engagement with understanding, but still proposed to break it off. Mia was happy to hear this proposal, but her grandmother immediately refused, and the girl did not react very happily. In the world of the 21st century, no one gets married like that, and her classmates laugh at her. My grandmother explained that this wedding was arranged by her late grandfather Henry and their family, the Lee family. She stated that as long as she was alive, the wedding would be held. Sam decided to stand up for Mia, because she has her own head to think and decide who will be her husband, but Grandma just ignored it and asked how he knew Mason and Edgar. Sam told him that they had been in contact for a long time and were on good terms and that Edgar often sharpened and cleaned his sword. Edgar replied that not everyone has the honor to touch such a treasure. Mia was very surprised by this behavior of the commander of the central part of China. Such a respected person enjoys a simple sword cleaning. Sam, realizing the seriousness of his grandmother's intentions, decided not to continue the argument and promised that he would protect her as his grandmother had done before and that if anyone hurt her, he would hurt them until the end of their family line. He told Edgar to tell the world that Mia was under his protection and if they wanted to take her life, the sword of the eastern king would come for them. The grandmother praised him for his loyalty and respect for her and now her granddaughter, but Mia was not happy about it, because such a loud statement to the world was too much, but she did not dare to say her opinion out loud. When they finally arrived at the grandmother's house, a bunch of servants had come to meet the hostess and the guests. Other family members also came out to meet the guests, but when they saw Sam, they immediately changed their minds about a good guest. One of them started pointing his finger and talking about the boy in a very insolent way. He said that the accident was not an accident and everyone knew about it, but his grandmother took him in and saved him anyway, incurring the wrath of the three heads of the Moore family. This bold man approached the grandmother and began to persuade her to cancel Sam's engagement and marriage, which he thought was the best way out. All the others who had been standing there silently suddenly joined in the conversation and showed their support for his words, saying that they did not need to get into trouble for him. Mia was annoyed by this kind of talk, even if Sam was in the middle of those bad events and had something to do with them, it doesn't negate the fact that he is their guest who came from far away. You need to show respect, not show your character from the doorstep. Edgar could not resist such insults towards the commander and wanted to teach them a lesson by taking up his sword, but the commander stopped him by blocking the way with his hand. Her grandmother did not back down and was already talking about the future, calling Sam Mia's husband and not allowing him to be hurt as long as she lived in this world. Mia decided to try again to express her opinion about the wedding and express her dissatisfaction. The old woman ignored her granddaughter's words. Sam was also not against the cancellation, 
so he told his grandmother that everything was fine and he would treat her like his own sister. But his grandmother did not agree to this option either and still stood her ground. Sam didn't give up and suggested a way out, because if he broke off the engagement, it would have a bad impact on the family's reputation. But if they wrote the refusal, he would just sign it and everything would be fine. Mia asked if this would affect Sam's reputation, but he brushed it off as nothing. The man who had spoken out too much before agreed with Sam's decision and decided for everyone that they would write a retraction. Edgar stepped in and threatened that if they dared to do that, not only would they be in trouble, but the whole family would be. Despite Sam's requests, Edgar did not calm down. The man continued to act tough and boldly spoke out about Edgar's threats, saying that he was no one to make such statements to him. Edgar responded with his status and assured him that he would be enough to fulfill what he said. But then the commander's army showed up, which he had previously sent back to his lands. Mason joined Edgar's threats and said that with such a force they would easily reach their family. This team was joined by another player, the commander of the South, Marshall. He had hair the color of lavender, like his eyes. He wore a cape on his shoulders that was fastened with a chain at his collarbone. All the commanders sided with Sam, including the commander of the West, Jacob, who had light red hair that tended to be red. It was the longest of all the commanders, almost reaching his shoulder. He wore a blue sleeveless shirt and held his sword between his crossed arms. All four commanders gathered in one place. Eastern Tiger, Mason. Blade of Fire. Edgar, Southern Marquis, Marshal. Air Sword of the West. Jacob. Four of the five commanders are here to congratulate Sam. Everyone greeted each other differently, according to their customs and culture. Marshall put the redhead to his heart and bowed easily and expressed his respect. Jacob, as a martial arts master, showed a gesture that can be used as a sign of greeting and respect. The family was not prepared for such a development and were very surprised at what such people were doing here. Mason continued to press the family and asked if they were really so sure of their status. The relatives froze in place and opened their mouths, but did not say anything. Only one of them replied that he believed they were influential enough to prevent the men from reaching them with their threats. His grandmother replied that he was too confident to make such loud statements, and Sam asked her not to worry about such things. She replied that as long as he was here, she had nothing to worry about, but she was still annoyed by these self-confident faces in the Lee family. They just couldn't see past their own noses and didn't realize what they were doing. Sam decided to demonstrate what they could do. So Edgar notified everyone that an A1 alert was coming. He was wearing a bracelet, but not an ordinary one, with a video and radio transmitter. The second he sounded the alarm, somewhere in the city center, in a glass building, they were ready to take action. A girl with black hair and a business casual outfit announced through Edgar's bracelet, which displayed her hologram, that 72 locations in the cities were already on alert. She also asked to confirm the accuracy of the information and emphasized that the Dragon Guard would be on the alert if there was a threat to people. Sam said that 72 points was too many. Only one point would be enough. Edgar immediately accepted the order and informed the girl's hologram of the changes to the order to recall all but one. The girl approved and began to execute the order. The boy who had been standing behind the girl came over and asked who it was, and from what he had seen, it was clear that the commander respected the person. The girl sighed and replied that it was an ordinary man named Sam. Everyone's mouths dropped open at this surprise, because the same Sam, the one who is the King of the North and who was nicknamed the God of War, was an acquaintance of their commander. The girl confirmed the boy's words and said that she knew nothing more about him. His file is closed on the ninth floor, to which she has no access. We move again to the family, who were not only shocked by what was happening, but also scared. But only one of them did not calm down, the one who was very confident in his strength and connections. He mistakenly decided that these were just cheap actors who were here to talk to them, because time passed and nothing changed. So he decided to invite his actors here as well, and picked up the phone to call someone. Before he could call anyone, he saw something strange on his phone that startled him. 
he realized that the signal was not working and panicked and started screaming. When everyone looked in their rooms, they saw the same picture and started to get scared. The one who first started insulting Sam was shaking with fear and did not fully believe that it was his doing. The Dragon Guild arrived and asked all the outsiders to leave. At the head of this group was a guy with long hair that touched his shoulder blades, tied back at the top but loose at the back. Their uniforms were unremarkable, just a black shirt and pants, nothing fancy. He ordered the other soldiers to take control of the Lee family and arrest them. The family was shocked, but no one said anything in protest and they were simply led away. Sam assured his grandmother that everything would be fine and they were not in danger, they just needed to be put in their place. He told my grandmother that he wanted to visit the Kong family, but my grandmother was not happy about this and said that it had happened thirteen years ago. But he responded angrily, saying that it didn't matter how many years ago it happened, he remembered it perfectly and didn't want to forget. After saying goodbye to Mia and Grandma and saying he had to go, Edgar did not follow Sam and remained standing next to the women. But then his grandmother made an unexpected announcement about Sam's family. His mother had survived the attack. He was stunned by the news, and his grandmother continued without letting him recover from what she had heard, telling him what his mother did for a living and where she was, she was a professor at the university. Sam didn't say anything to that, didn't ask why, didn't ask how it happened, where they had been all this time, nothing. He just silently turned around and walked away with heavy thoughts. The University of the City of Dragons, where his mother worked. Since that terrible night, she had changed, her hair had grown back, wrinkles had appeared on her face, and most importantly, she was in a wheelchair. She was giving a lecture, some of the students were just sleeping on the desk, when Sam walked into the classroom and looked at her silently. She didn't notice him, so he just sat down at the back of the classroom and couldn't believe his eyes, it was really his mother. One of the students did not want to sit through the lecture because she was not interested. She wanted to go outside, unwind and play with her friends, and her classmates said that she could because her father was the deputy dean, but he was not that brave. The girl agreed, but she still couldn't leave just like that, she had to write a statement with a reason why she was missing the class. She was the only teacher who had such rules, so she was called strict. The interlocutor said that she was not as strict as she seemed, and that such a beautiful woman had no reason to pursue a career at the university, but rather to earn money with her body, if it was not all paralyzed. Sam, hearing such talk about his mother, could not help but ask the teacher to be respectful. He asked what he cared about their conversations and who he was. The boy began to brazenly express his thoughts on how a woman can earn money, and with a smug smile asked if his mother was his mother. Sam could not stand it, and jumped out of his seat he took the guy by the head and slammed his face into the desk. The girl screamed, announcing the fight. The teacher asked him to stop, and Sam looked at her and was completely devastated. He shook with pity and called her mom. She did not expect to see him and asked if it was him. He ran up to her on one knee and told her it was him, her son. A man covered in wrinkles was sweeping the university grounds with a broom and Sam and his mother approached him and called him her beloved, who turned out to be his father, who had also miraculously survived. They called him Sammy, and when my father saw his Sammy, he hugged him tightly. Everyone was very happy to see him after so many years of separation. The father asked anxiously why his son had come back here, because it was still not safe for them. The son assured them that there was nothing to worry about, that he would use his king's blade to wash away the mud of injustice and shame that had tormented and haunted them for thirteen long years. Then he suggested that they just go home, and they silently agreed. Suddenly, a student appeared who wanted to leave the class, but she was not alone, but with her father and two guards. She complained to Sam that he had beaten up a boy, who turned out to be her favorite, who had been talking about the teacher. The deputy dean started shouting why he had attacked the student right in the classroom and asked how Edwin was related to this guy. Edwin replied that it was his son. The deputy dean, of course, did not know that he had a son, so he was surprised at first, but then he yelled at him 
and said that his son needed to be taught manners. He began to threaten his father so that he would not forget how it all started, how he had begged for a job on his knees and now he could fire him at any moment. His son was not expecting to hear this, so he asked why his father was kneeling, but he told him not to think about it because he was from the Khan family. Sam heard that the vice dean was just the family's dog and turned around and walked forward while the man continued to yell at who he called a dog. Sam could not stand this insolence toward him and his parents and ordered him to kneel. And for the first time he showed his strength. The wind rose from one wave of his hand and hit him under the knees like a stick. He could not help but fall to the ground. The daughter screamed to her father what he was doing, because there was no wind and no one knew how it happened. Sam vowed to take revenge on them for all the misfortunes and insults they had done and said over the years. The mother was silent all this time, but even without words it was clear that she was upset, because on such a joyful day everything had gone wrong at once. The deputy dean was not as brave as he had been at first. The surprise caused him to shit his pants, which were now wet, and he complained that his legs were broken. The guards tried to lift him up, holding him under their arms, while he continued to whimper. They came to a not very good neighborhood. The houses were in bad condition, the windows were broken, not a single tree, just empty streets. They approached their apartment door, which was opened by the father. The mother asked him to go to the store to buy something to make dinner for Sam. The man let his son and the woman go ahead, asked Sam to take care of the wheelchair, and carried his mother down the stairs. The son was very indignant that all these years they had been living in some godforsaken place. But the parents said that they were satisfied with their place of residence, of course, except for the humidity and dampness. Sam called out for Edgar, and surprisingly enough, he appeared immediately. He told him to send people to pick up his parents and bring them to a good place. His mother assured him that everything was fine and they were used to living like this and asked him not to worry. Sam couldn't just forget everything that family had done to them how they had ruined their lives and deprived them of everything. He was shaking with rage. Sam said that he would definitely get to those three, and the first one would be the old man. He took his mother out of the room and outside. After gathering all the leaders, the fifth arrived, and he had the longest hair of all the leaders, reaching his tailbone. His name was Ethan. It was light purple in color with white bangs. He took the sword of the northern king and brought it here but he suddenly broke out of his serious persona and smilingly called Sam his brother and asked for permission to play with his sword, which he was holding in his hand, to which Sam replied that he was done with nonsense and asked him to hand it over. Ethan threw the sword toward Sam and Sam caught it with his hand. The sword had a dark hilt with a golden tip and was kept in a black scabbard with a golden pattern running along one side. He asked the commanders to step aside to talk to his parents. Ethan turned to Edgar and warned him that when the sword left the scabbard, no one could stop it, and asked what kind of person could make the boss, as he called him, take it. Edgar assumed that it must be some bad guy. But the commander of China's East was not easily fooled, so he immediately recognized the lie and threatened him with disaster if he did not tell him what was happening. Edgar decided not to argue and immediately told them what was going on and who they were dealing with. The Khan family was not too much of an opponent, but she had brought a lot of grief to Sam's family, so they did not think to take pity on them. It was evening, dark clouds filled the sky, and events were taking place in a house. Some guy was praying to a golden Buddha and a gift from the president of the company, a Santa with the most sincere birthday wishes for their patriarch. Many people or representatives of families gathered there. They seemed to be showing off their gifts to each other. Someone gave a century-old ginseng and sixteen jade bracelets. Another gave two thousand-year-old vases and wishes for good luck and long life. Suddenly a noise was heard and everyone turned around to see who it was. At the same time, others were holding a funeral procession and people started muttering that it was a bad sign. Ethan walked in front of the column and decided to surprise everyone with a non-standard gift in the form of a large bell and a coffin. The people who carried the bell threw it under the feet of the guests. It was so heavy that the stone under it cracked. But he ordered his servants to cry, 
and they did. People started whispering and saying that they had come here to cause trouble. The bell is only given on the last journey, but since the birthday boy was still alive, it was nothing more than a threat. A man older than the guests came out, his wrinkles betraying him, and he asked if Ethan and the others had a grudge against the Khan family. Ethan replied politely that he had no hard feelings against the family, and that this was his first time in the city. But he emphasized that they had barely found such a large bell on the eastern border, but the city of dragons was not the capital of the eight dynasties for nothing. There were indeed many relics here. The servants behind him were still sobbing. The old man who asked about the images thought about the border and realized that this boy was Edwin and Cora's son. That's where they came in, Sam, his father and mother. Sam introduced himself as the eldest son of the third generation of the Khan family and came to express birthday greetings to his second great-uncle. Everyone whispered behind the old man's back, recalling the times when they tried to take his family's life. The old man decided to play the role of the good guy and greeted the guests with a smile, seeing Cora's chair, which was in a bad shape, and offered to give them a new one. Edwin refused the old man's offer, and then a boy with a bow around his neck popped up and said that they were not welcome here, and the old man asked him to watch his language. The man stepped aside and invited the newcomers into the house to talk. In his mind, the old man was thinking that he shouldn't take the skeletons out of the closet in front of witnesses and finish them off without prying eyes. While waiting for the guests to enter the house, the boy decided to play a little prank and tripped Edwin, who flew down, but Sam stopped him in time with his hand. And then the grief with the bow came up and began to speak boldly to his brother, that today, on such a great holiday, he should have knelt down. Sam asked his father not to be distracted by trifles, because tonight they were the main figures of the evening. When they passed the family, Ethan wanted to take care of the bully, sword in hand. He drew two swords and stabbed the boy with the bow in his knees. As the boy stood there with his swords in his lap, astonished but not making a sound, people marveled at his fighting techniques. A man shouted that Sam was going too far to which the boy replied that this was only the beginning and he had not even begun what he planned to do, giving the old man an evil look. The old man did not expect such an answer, and neither did everyone else who stood nervously watching this dialogue. The old man began to stammer in fright, asking what Sam meant. The boy suggested a version of the complete destruction of the Kong family by touching the hilt of his sword. It started to rain outside so everyone decided to move inside the church. In the large hall, where the tables were set up, the noun cheerfully thanked everyone and their gifts by raising a glass. The door was opened by Ethan and Edgar, giving way to the family. Sam wished his second grandfather health and many years of life. Everyone was amazed to see him, but the grandfather did not even realize who the young man was, so he simply emphasized his courage and accepted the greeting with thanks. A man with blonde hair got up from the table and came over to Sam and emphasized Sam's bad manners, because when greeting a patriarch, one should kneel down. Ethan asked him who he thought he was crucifying here, and he replied with his name. His name was Smith, and he was a respected man in the circles of the Dragon City, so he was not addressed without due respect. Ethan replied that this was the first time he had heard the name. The man with the bald spot on the top of his head spoke very dismissively of Ethan's guest, saying that he had only just gotten out of the cave yesterday if he didn't know the name of such a high-ranking person in their land. The commander called one of the soldiers who had grazed long, light-colored hair. The birthday boy was very surprised to hear his name. He asked Gray what to do with the man who had insulted him, and by the look on the soldier's face, one could see how he would have handled the matter. Gray suggested a completely humane way to beat him up and give him to the dogs for food, and the man almost turned green with fear when he heard this suggestion. Edgar approached him and asked him to stop playing with the man and offered his option of stripping him of all his property, money and companies. Embarrassed, Gray accepted the order until the man could recover from this turn of events. Ethan ran up to Smith and punched him in the face, telling him that he would not be able to escape. The mother turned to her son and emphasized the promise he had made to her. Sam told Ethan to stop playing the man and get out of the way, 
and he listened with a smile on his face. The old man mistakenly thought that they had only bribed Commander Gray to help them. The old man turned to Gray, asking him why he was here, because they had never interfered in their affairs before, so what made them come now? Sam interrupted the conversation and said that if it was a family matter, they should settle it among themselves. Everyone who was not a member of the Kong family or had no relation to it left the room at Sam's request. The old man asked if it was too expensive to bribe Commander Gray, but he had now left with everyone, so now there was no one to protect him. What was he going to do in that case? Ethan turned to Sam with a smile on his face and said that the old man didn't know who they were. Calling them stupid, the old man asked one of the guys standing behind him, whose name was Kim, to escort them out the door. He bragged with arrogance and asked that they hadn't thought that the Kong family would have a first-level personal master. The man lit up with a purple light that streamed upward. Cora began to worry about her son, but he just silently stepped forward. The man rushed toward Sam, realizing his advantage, and boldly declared that he would take them all down with it. As soon as he got close to Sam, he abruptly froze, not understanding why, while Sam emitted small jets of blue flame that were barely noticeable. The air spread like waves of water across the floor as Sam told the enemy to kneel. This stream knocked him down and brought the enemy to his knees. Grandpa jumped up and shouted what was happening. Meanwhile, Kim was on his knees shaking with fear and could barely say that this was the level of a war god. Everyone who stayed there and watched the scene began to get scared. No one understood what was happening. Kim couldn't even touch Sam. He shouted again for everyone to kneel, and waves of air came from him again, but this time with more force, which brought everyone in the room to their knees, except for those behind Sam. Ethan explained that Sam had come to them at the age of seven and had reached the level of a warrior in just a month, that he was a unique fighter, a natural talent, so they should not have underestimated him. Their fighter was not even close to Sam's level. My grandfather was very impressed by this story and did not understand how this was possible. Ethan continued the story. At the age of 17, Sam already had the level of a war god and was granted the title, King of the North, but he refused it because he wanted to remain an ordinary man. This shock made his grandfather's face turn blue. He bowed his head in fear and did not know what to do. The mother was horrified by what she heard and put her hand over her mouth and asked her son how many other terrible things he had experienced over the years, but he turned to her with a smile and assured her that he was fine. Then he turned to his enemies and said with a malicious look that thirteen years ago his own grandfather was killed in this very hall by this old man, and the fourth uncle left this life from a stab wound in the heart at the hands of Cole just for helping them escape. He had seen it with his own eyes as a toddler. With such anger and resentment, his aura hung in the air and pressed on the perpetrators present, who were already trembling with fear. His own grandfather loved and protected him, and his fourth uncle treated him like his own son. Sam could not forgive them and had to avenge them. The old man shouted that he was very wrong and asked for forgiveness, and the other one just sobbed. After everything he had been through and the attempts to take their lives, Sam was not going to forgive anyone or let anyone live. If the Lee family's grandmother had not saved him that night, he might have really fallen at the hands of these petty people who did not think about the lives or feelings of the people they hurt, but only about power and their own wealth. He pulled the sword out of its sheath and threw it at the floor, and it got stuck in it, breaking the tiles. The old man saw the sword and started muttering that it was all karma. My grandfather quickly jumped up and ran toward the sword, but when he grabbed the hilt and started to pull, he could not pull it out, as if the sword was embedded in the ground. Sam laughed out loud and revealed the truth that he could not believe. The sword of the King of the North weighed 360 kilograms. An ordinary person could never lift that sword. Suddenly, Sam raised his sword and stabbed the old man in the neck. The sword spilled out of the air and the old man was no longer alive. After that, Cole ran toward Sam, shouting about challenging him to a life-and-death battle. But as soon as he approached, even before he could raise his hand, he lost and fell after his father. Everyone else continued to kneel, shaking at the sight. As he passed Kim, 
Sam gave him the order to kneel for the rest of his life to feel his father's humiliation and his mother's sadness and pain. Kim, shaking with terror, did not dare to raise his head, let alone say anything in protest. The son came up to his parents and addressed his father, saying that now all the family's property and companies belonged to him, as they should have from the beginning, and his father was not expecting this, so he was surprised. Sam told them. He wanted to visit the grave of his fourth uncle and asked him to wait here. It was still raining outside, so Mason threw a raincoat over Sam. But a car pulled up to them, and Jacob closed the road between the car and Sam. When he asked who it was, an old man got out and came to see the young man who had hurt the eldest grandson of the Liang Smith family. But after watching him, he became strong enough to allow himself to do such things. Jacob decided to take it upon himself to clear the way for the commander-in-chief, but Marshall stopped him, saying that they were not on their own land, so they should not draw their sword and rule in another territory. They were also joined by the grandmother and granddaughter of the Lee family. The son who was standing behind and holding the umbrella for the head of the Liang family said that the Lee family was bankrupt, so they had nothing to fear from them, but his father interrupted him and said that although they were weakened, the foundation was solid, so even after the old family left, the family would be able to stand. Grandma asked if Mr. Liang had come to greet and wish happiness to the patriarch of the Kong family. Grandpa said no, because a man like him would never greet a man who had hurt his family. The old man explained the reason for his visit was that a man from the Kong family had attacked his grandson, pointing a finger at Sam, and he wanted the patriarch to answer for it. Smith yelled from the car that he was the one who had done this to him. Ethan asked if they were sure they needed the patriarch, because it would be hard to hear anything from him, unless he was clairvoyant. The old man was surprised and replied that today was the day of his 80th birthday, when he had left this world, to which Ethan replied, with a smile, that such things are very insidious and come under different circumstances, especially when you don't expect it, such as life, such as fate. The grandmother offered her candidacy. The Liang family wanted to settle this situation with their grandson, but it was late in the afternoon and raining, so it was time to leave and go home. The situation with the head of the Kong family and his grandmother's advice to send him home seemed suspicious to him. It was still a mystery to the old man where this boy from the Kong family had come from, and the whole thing seemed dangerous for him. So he hesitated and wanted to accept the conditions that had already been put forward to him. But his family protested, Smith did not want to leave it so easily, and his son said that by striking Smith, they had struck a blow against their entire family. The grandmother emphasized her proposal and asked him to think carefully. His family had been protecting its status and well-being for centuries. Did he not want only six of the seven great families of the Dragon City to remain? The old man thanked her for the offer, but his opinion remained unchanged. Someone must pay for the attack on his grandson. Ethan wanted to interrupt the conversation, but Sam prevented him and started talking himself, calling his younger brother the offender, whom he would not leave in trouble and therefore decided to be responsible for him. The old man called Frank, a stocky man with a slightly darker skin color, black hair and a sparse beard. Mia was worried about Sam and warned her that he was the fourth strongest man in their village. The grandmother told her not to worry, because Sam promised to always protect her, and the girl blushed. Sam decided to show off his skills to his fiancée and show the difference in their fighting levels. First, there are students who are not much different from ordinary people in terms of combat capabilities. Then there are fighters of the first level like him, who are already much stronger than ordinary people. Then there are such ranks as warrior, general, and the top is the god of war. During the conversation, Sam began to demonstrate his strength in action. A significant sign of the god of war from other ranks is the power that can extinguish an entire army. He began to radiate power that the wind reached such a strength that the enemy could barely stand. Sam confirmed his grandmother's words and said that he was not lying when he said that, and Mia blushed and felt very happy. He also almost forgot to say that he had more than a hundred warriors under his command, with the rank of a war god. Frank hadn't expected this, so he was nervous. There was also a difference in levels among the war gods, 
Sam was currently the strongest. A snake silhouette appeared behind him. With a wave of his hand, Sam hit him in the chest with a jet of air and knocked him down. Frank fell loudly to the ground and coughed at the feet of the Leong family, who were no longer so confident in their actions and were shocked by what they saw. His father came out at the noise and apologized for not meeting him properly. The old man was amazed to see Edwin back in his family. The man apologized for his son and explained that he was not very familiar with etiquette, but since everyone was here, he should open the main hall to celebrate the occasion and invited him inside. The old man noted Edwin's good knowledge of etiquette, unlike Sam. They accepted the invitation and stepped inside, the host letting the guests go in front. When they entered, they were met by many soldiers lined up on both sides of the main entrance. The old family head's son, Liang, was already shaking, even though nothing had happened yet. And when he saw Kim still kneeling, he was terrified. He knew that he was one of the three heads of the family and a martial arts master, but he didn't know why he was kneeling, and he wondered how they managed to make him kneel. And then they saw the traces of the battle, and the old man was already wishing he hadn't agreed to the old woman's suggestion to just solve this another day, because today there were big changes in this family, not good changes, and it was not the place or time for a nice tea party. Sam decided to put his grandmother in the most important and honorable place. Neither father nor son was happy to be in this place when the whirlwind of events was raging. Meanwhile, the grandmother sent her granddaughter to find Cora. The old man decided to have a nice conversation before it got too sad and asked if Edwin had returned to his family. My grandmother also decided to take part in the conversation and emphasized that he had not only returned, but had become its leader. Grandpa was surprised, but didn't say anything about it. And Edwin emphasized that he had no special talents, so he hoped for a helping hand from the old man. He introduced Sam as his eldest son in the third generation and his grandfather responded too nicely, given the past events, and welcomed such a good young man. Grandma started talking about the growing generation of the Leung family, which ensured a good future for his. Grandpa was embarrassed and asked her not to joke like that, because compared to Sam, his grandchildren were a disgrace. Without waiting for the opportunity, the grandfather decided to interrupt the meeting and run away, excusing the late hour thanking them for the great conversation and delicious tea. After saying goodbye to the Khan family, they walked to their car and Grandpa reflected on the great changes that would come to their town with Sam's return and the new head of the Khan family, Edwin. His father asked where Sam was going at such a late hour of the evening, to which Sam replied that he still wanted to visit the grave today and would be back soon. He came to the cemetery to visit the grave of his fourth uncle, whose name was Michael. Sam did not expect such a surprise when he approached the grave. It was open, the monument was lying on the ground, but it was not only his uncle's grave that looked like that, another grave near him that belonged to his grandfather. When Sam saw this picture, he was furious and ordered an investigation to find the person who did it. The commanders, not wanting to entrust such responsibility to their subordinates, decided to find the culprit on their own. Edgar kicked down the front door and went into the room of the watchman, who had surveillance videos that he used to monitor the cemetery. The watchman panicked and asked who they were and what they wanted, raising his hands to the sky. Edgar replied that two graves in the northeastern part of the cemetery had been looted and the ashes from those graves stolen. The man replied in fright that he did not know who it was. Edgar began to pull his sword out of its sheath making a scary expression on his face and asking if he was sure he didn't know. The watchman fell to his knees and began to beg for mercy. He said that seven years ago a young couple, a boy and a girl, came and took them away. Edgar was surprised that the man remembered the events of seven years ago, and the old man explained that he had been paid one hundred thousand for his silence, a situation that was hard not to remember. Edgar told him to tell everything in detail and that he would get as much as they had paid, and threw a check for one hundred thousand on the floor near the guard. The man, of course, told the events of that evening. So Edgar didn't return empty-handed, holding a letter in one hand. Sam asked if the man had found out what had happened. Edgar said yes and told the story of the young couple, as well as what the watchman had described about their appearance. 
Sam didn't even look at the rough portrait of the criminals, but told the artists to draw them better, and when they found the thieves, to punish them without mercy. Sam ordered Mason to use his connections to influence the situation so that the offenders could be found and punished faster. He called everyone else back inside. It was still night and raining outside. The father went out to look through the family's documents and froze. Sam saw this and said that he should rest. The father hadn't heard his son return, so he was surprised. Sam came closer and asked what was wrong. Something was wrong with the documents, and the father replied that this was an understatement. The family's funds were managed by an irresponsible man who had led to a debt of billions, and the company's shares were pledged. The son offered to help, and then the mother appeared, who was dropped off by Mia. She said that Sam had nothing to take on his shoulders and the problems of this family. The son wanted to argue, but changed his mind and turned to Mia asking if she would stay here. She said that her grandmother asked her to stay and talk to her Aunt Cora. The mother reiterated that her son had nothing to worry about and told him to leave these problems to his father. But he said it was nothing and called the president's office and the secretary said he was already asleep and asked him to call back tomorrow morning. Sam told him to wake up. He was worried about an ordinary person from the northern border. The mother said that her son was asking for help too rudely and that no one would help him with such an attitude. The father asked who he had called, but Sam brushed it off and called the president just an ordinary acquaintance. Sam decided to run away and said he was going to have a snack and then it would be time for bed. Mia criticized the boy for his bad manners. He was too spoiled. If you ask for help like that, no one will want to help. But he left his phone number on, and it did ring. And not only Mia was amazed, but her parents were as well. Mia didn't believe that someone had actually called, and her father was curious who he had asked for help. There was a video call and the girl recognized the person on the phone. It was Nick, the richest man in the world. He was quite young had brown hair and a mustache, and wore an expensive brown suit. His father was amazed to see the richest man in the world that Sammy had been talking about so easily. The father picked up the phone and Nick asked who he was talking to. Edwin said that it was his son Sam's phone, and he had just left, and if he was busy, he would tell his son to call back later. Nick hesitantly replied that no, he was completely free. The father saw his son slowly carrying a tray of fruit into the room and told him to hurry up because he had received a call from Mr. Nick. The man addressed Sam as his majesty, but the boy asked to be called by his first name, he was at home now. Nick awkwardly agreed to this and called him Mr. Kong, saying that he didn't have his phone with him so he didn't answer right away, apologizing for that and assuring him that if he had known about the call, he would have answered immediately. Sam assured him not to worry about it and asked him to pay back the old debt. Nick said that of course he would help after what Sam had done for his family. Three years ago, he saved their family, and if he needs help, the man is always ready. Mia understood why he was so respectful of the guy. Everyone would be grateful if their life was saved. Sam asked for an estimate of the value of their debts and asked his father for the exact figure. His father answered, he said that they were in catastrophic debt, eight billion in principal and several in interest, and wanted to offer another option, but Nick interrupted and said that he would give ten billion, but that it still wouldn't compare to what he had done for him. Sam turned to his father and asked if this money would be enough. Nick beat his father to the punch and said that if it wasn't enough, he could add ten billion dollars. The family was amazed at the amount of money, they thought it was Yuan but they were discussing the amount in dollars. The father said that this amount was too much for them, and that two billion dollars would be enough for them. Nick asked, shocked, that they really only needed two billion, and his father replied that they would pay it back when they got back on their feet. Nick refused to take the money back and said to consider it a gift. Edwin said it was a very large sum, and they could not just accept it as a gift. His father thanked him from the bottom of his heart, and recognized his generosity and sincerity. Sam understood why he was trying so hard to help them. Nick just wanted to lure Sam to his side with the debt that Sam now owed, because not many people could keep such a strong warrior around. Sam spoke to his father, and if all the problems were now settled, it was time to go to bed. 
Sam asked Mia if she had a test tomorrow, and she asked him how he knew about it. Sam did not answer the question, but told her to go to bed and that he would give her a ride tomorrow. He took Mia's mother's wheelchair and took her to her room as well. In the morning, Sam drove Mia to her university as promised. The assistant opened the door and informed her that she had arrived at her destination. Her classmate ran up to her and asked her why she was driving the Kong family's car instead of her own, and she was curious about who had given her a ride. Sam rolled down his car window and showed himself. His classmate couldn't stand it and called him handsome. Asking who he was, Mia reacted to these words with reddened cheeks and began to mumble under her breath, not knowing how to introduce him better, while Sam sat silently in the car and smiled. The girl immediately guessed from her friend's reaction that it was Sam, her fiancé, and Mia started to brush it off, saying that she didn't know who they were talking about. The friend decided to talk to the guy and asked him what university he was studying at. Mia told her friend not to ask and answered for Sam that he was not studying anywhere. Sam confirmed Mia's words and said that he hadn't studied at a regular university, but had attended the Blade Military Academy and asked if that counted. Just then, their classmate Mickey, who had overheard the conversation, shouted and was shocked by what he heard. The classmate asked if he knew anything about this academy. Another university student came out and said that it was a lie. This academy was third-rate and people were just being deceived there. Mickey protested and said that there were good warriors studying at this academy. One of them was his brother, whom he thought was incredible. The student said that his brother was the hope of their village, and it was just unbelievable that he had ended up in such a place for idiots. They can now thank their ancestors for such joy and asked if he had expressed himself better now. Sam got out of the car and slammed the door loudly. His look did not bode well. Mia started to worry, because if Sam started a fight, it would end badly. She ran up and wanted to stop it, so she asked him why he wasn't going home, he was in a hurry, and Sam asked her why she started to follow him out. The student was angry with Sam because he had been courting Mia for a long time, and then this alleged fiancé appeared out of nowhere. He came up to greet Sam and introduced himself as Ken and asked about the academy he studied at as it was the first time he had heard of it. Sam didn't say anything in response and just smiled at him. Ken was pissed off by this behavior and mentally scolded Sam, and then he said that not everyone needs to know about the existence of such an academy. Mia's friend took it personally and got very angry, but Mia assured him that it was definitely not about her, so she could relax and ignore his words. Mickey explained what kind of academy it was, it accepted students at the age of 16 and after five years of study they leave with the rank of officer. This place can be considered the birthplace of great generals. Ken turned to Sam and asked him what his rank was at that academy, to which he replied, as usual, that he was an ordinary person. Ken thought he was going to say the rank of an officer, but he was just a clown who decided to deceive them, the university students. Mia decided to stand up for her future husband and said that he would never lie, and asked Ken not to make a scene. Sam reassured her and said she thought too highly of the guy if she thought he could hurt his feelings. The girl asked him where he was going, and Sam replied that he just wanted to kill someone. Ken laughed and said he was an arrogant braggart. Sam was angry, but the girl intervened and said that he had promised his mother he would not fight anyone. He said he remembered and the girl calmed down a bit, a slight smile appearing on her face. Sam asked the bully if he was from Shur's family, and he responded by asking if he knew his family. Ken said if he did, he knew better than to mess with them and told him to stay away from Mia. Sam asked him to tell the head of the family to come to his house at 8 p.m. tonight and open the car door. Ken attacked the boy and asked him who he thought he was if he thought his older uncle would care about him and advised him to get himself checked out by a psychologist. Sam was tired of hearing the insults, so he gave up and used his strength, and the wind picked up and gained enough strength to push the boy to the ground. Ken grabbed his wounded shoulder with his hand, and the girl put her hand over her face in despair, because it had happened again, Sam had started a fight. Her friend was standing next to her shocked by what she saw. 
the guy got into his car without saying anything and sped off. It turned out he had arrived home, and he met his mother in the hall and said hello. She started talking about her uncle, who was still on his knees. The mother suggested that they let him go, because he hadn't moved during the night and he was still their relative. The son reacted skeptically and asked them not to worry about this man who had tried to attack them the day before. He deserved the punishment, but he would not get off so easily. Sam chose the next target for himself, who was George, and the son asked his mother if she would try to stop him, to which she simply remained silent. The events took place that rainy night. Cora was on her knees, crying and asking for the gate to be opened, beating on the red door with her hands, begging for Sam to come back. The son, seeing his mother like this, could not help but cry. He took her hand and called her, while tears of despair ran down her cheeks. A car arrived, driven by his father, and he opened the window and shouted that they had to get out of here because they were already being searched for and were very close. The fourth uncle ran out to them and urged them to stop and not to beg, shouting that they had to run away. But Cora didn't give up, she was still part of her family, so they had to help her, she kept begging. He ran over and grabbed her by the shoulders, urging her to walk faster to the car, he looked back at the gate anxiously, little Sam holding his mother's hand all the while. But then the gate suddenly opened and something flew at his uncle's back. He fell face down and never got up. Everyone screamed at the sight, the woman just stared at her uncle's body with tears in her eyes, and a man came out of the gate, already with the beginnings of wrinkles on his face and glasses, holding the sword he had just stabbed his uncle in the back. This was the man Sam wanted to end his life. It was a bright day outside, with clouds floating serenely across the blue sky. Sam was driving to the very gate where it all began. The gatekeepers noticed the Kong family's car and asked who was visiting. One of them replied that it didn't matter who it was and ordered them to open the gate and inform the butler of the Kong family's arrival. They opened the gate, letting the car in. Sam muttered that he remembered the gate, which had remained closed that night despite their relatives' pleas. His mother and father also went with him, Cora clearly concerned and not expressing approval of coming here after so many years. A bunch of people had gathered to meet the guests, and one of the family members came up and asked why they had come and still not gotten out of the car. Sam replied that he was waiting for the head of the family to come up and open the door for him. The man jerked back and didn't know what to say, and the other people standing behind him started whispering. They didn't recognize him, but they could tell by his voice that the young man was overreacting for his age but I decided to get out of this situation and not to make a scandal out of it. I offered my own candidacy to open the door for him. When he opened the door, to say he was shocked is an understatement. He was not expecting to see Edwin with Cora. He was joined by another man who had long hair. He shouted out to them. He did not expect to see his sister there. Cora said hello to her brother, but he shouted that he was not her brother and said that she had long since ceased to be part of their family. They looked nothing alike, even though they were related. Cora had brown hair and light green eyes, and her brother had light purple hair and eyes the same color as his hair. The man who opened the door ordered the servants to throw them out. He called it great luck, but he thought it was Cole who had come to see them. Sam got out of the car and went to the back door where his parents were sitting. He was wearing a black cloak and had his sword with him. He asked them why they were in such a hurry to drive them away. Perhaps they felt guilty about what they had done that night. 